All right, everybody, it's about that time. Cool. Let's uh, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome back to Environmental Interpretation. Uh, keeping an eye on the weather report for this coming week. Things are finally starting to warm back up. Um, the warm air mass that pushed the sort of low stratospheric, supercooled uh, air mass down across North America has uh, mostly pushed through for us at least. And uh, things are gonna get back to a little bit more like what we generally expect them to be. So that means um, I'm keeping an eye on the weather forecast for Wednesday. I would love for us to be able to meet on campus and start trying out some skills demos and maybe some of these games that we've been talking about. So let's, uh, let's get back into it. Does anybody have any announcements for like RSOs and stuff like that before we begin class? Anything like forestry club meetings or is Conclave canceled again this year or are they doing that? Does anybody know? I don't know. Okay, so we're gonna take that as not so much any announcements. Um, I have finally gotten through the uh, first wave of summer camp meetings. So if you are planning on going on summer camp this summer, um, all the indications right now with COVID-19 are that things are starting to wrap up and clear up pretty well. It's gonna be months and months and months before everybody's all vaccinated, but we've got um, hundreds of millions more doses on the way in the short term and kind of the next month and a half. So um, I'm feeling pretty optimistic. We have as good chances as any year at this point, I think, to actually go on summer camp instead of pushing it online. So all I have to say, we're gonna have uh, probably the second round of meetings starting to look at some of the skills like, um, you know, practicing with gear, stuff like that. Um, so we'll be doing some skill demos in that class as well uh, for some of these meeting. So if you're coming on summer camp, uh, keep an eye out for those announcements. Uh, probably won't have a meeting this week, but um, we'll start moving that direction pretty soon because next week is March already. I don't know when that happened, but um, okay. That's the only announcement I have. Uh, let's talk some more about game design and uh, just kind of try it out a little bit. So we spent kind of the last two class sessions talking about the principles of game design because um, there's a lot there and uh, hopefully your notes are uh, good and available to you. Today's gonna be much less of a lecture day and more of a, let's just toss out some ideas for different game designs that you can use for uh, your particular chosen interp topics. Kind of like we ended our last class session with on Wednesday, if you think back to that. So um, I'll kind of lead the charge and take us through one or a couple of examples. Hopefully that will be um, you know, pretty recognizable. And we'll kind of use that to uh, give everybody a chance to pull out their notes from last week and we'll get back into uh, prototyping some game designs. Um, so today we're gonna do that mostly uh, in interactive talking back and forth format. Um, and this is called in the design process a charrette. I'll put that vocab word in chat. And oh, uh, we got an SAF meeting tonight. So that's where in 187, Logan? Were you guys doing it online or what? 187, gotcha. Cool. All right. Uh, I haven't seen 187 in like almost a week, so say hi for me. Uh, yeah, so what we're doing today is, uh, again, it's called a charrette. And the basic idea here is it's a chance to kind of paper prototype games uh, before actually trying stuff out. Um, so this is kind of the next step beyond talking about, so what possible game design could we have? It's more like actually talking through simulating playing some of these different ideas, okay? And we do this 
as a way to super cheaply, but also super effectively, since we got a bunch of smart people in the Zoom room today. Um, this is a great way for us to catch all the little stuff we didn't quite think about yet in our sort of budding game designs. Okay, so uh, if you recall, we had some chances to look at uh, game design brief um, put together by James Hostetler for actual straight up like board and video game industry professionals uh, and adapted for our class. And then we had a sort of a, a game design sort of worksheet exercise thing. And uh, the goal there was to just kind of pour a little bit of effort into those two documents for today and Wednesday's class so that we can have some game designs to uh, practice with. Okay, so if you haven't uh, pulled out your notes and the game design brief and the game design exercise, go ahead and have those to hand. Uh, they're up on screen if they're digital uh, or you know, have the printouts ready to go. And we'll talk through some of these. So I'll kind of lead the charge with uh, an initial example again. And then, you know, let's get right past me talking with you guys about stuff that you aren't doing, like some example game design, um, and get into what you are doing, which are your game designs to help you across the finish line for class. All right. So hopefully today's going to be a little bit of fun. And for anybody not presenting their game design to our charrette today. Uh, for everybody not doing that at any particular moment. So let's say Nick is presenting uh, his game and the rest of us are like players in the imaginary version of his game just for today. Um, our job is to find answers to the question, what could possibly go wrong? All right, so we are intentionally, uh, in the case of Nick as the game, you know, facilitator, the interpreter, um, trying to find the edge cases where somebody could misinterpret a rule and hurt themselves or hurt another participant, you know, on accident. Nobody's going to be um, malicious, but uh, if there's a way for somebody to get hurt in this game, even uh, unlikely but still possible, then we probably want to catch that now in this design phase because at this point, a super simple tweak to a rule or mechanic even though it's all contained in three sentences, um, you know, swapping a word in and out can really enhance the safety and effectiveness of what you're trying to do, okay? So we're looking for kind of safety loopholes. We're looking for things that are unclear. Um, we're looking for things that, uh, let's say, you know, Nick is an expert in um, fly fishing and so our game has something to do with fly fishing um, we're looking for anywhere that Nick maybe uses a bit of jargon specific to fly fishing that the rest of us just might not know about and it's so obvious to Nick that he's you know, just not thinking about it will help each other catch blind spots like jargon um, and help each other think of ways to economically but also very effectively put a human a regular human being um, sort of a regular common person out there on the street way of understanding that jargon without having to use a big, long, formal dictionary definition. Okay, so in lots of ways we can do that. And today's brainstorm is very much along those lines. So we're going to take any expectation of any of these games going right the first time whatsoever uh, off the table. There is no pressure to feel like you got to ace this the first time. Okay. Um, this is, this is going to be a new skill set for some of us, if not most of us in this class. So, uh, again, don't worry about, uh, people judging you and being like, oh, this is a stupid game design. We are all intentionally looking for the, uh, the rough points, the weak points in a particular game's design so that we can help each other make them stronger and feel very comfortable presenting them in front of mixed audiences. Okay, cool. So let me start. Um, let's start with a game where our general topic is maple syrup making. Okay, so this is a topic that at least two of you guys and gals have identified as kind of an interesting one for the semester. So if your game today is also about maple syrup making, we'll see what commonalities and differences we have. Okay, and the Topic's gonna be maple syrup making. The theme is that 
maple syrup making is a a beautiful tradition and legacy and also takes a little bit of skill not to harm the trees involved because they are donors like we value people who uh, donate blood plasma to hospitals and stuff like that um, for surgeries and trauma victims um, we want to value some of these trees for donating their lifeblood so to speak in much the same way all right so topic maple syruping theme we appreciate the trees that are helping us out so the thematic point under this theme in which we're gonna set our first example game here is gonna be a small game that is like anybody ever play the old cell phone game snakes or it used to be like light cycles where the snakes are moving around a bounded space and eventually they get so long they start hitting themselves and then that round is over it's going to be a game like that so our game here is to use actual in your head for today to use actual silicone rubber tubing that will take the unrefined sap from the tree down to the sugar shack for purification um, or uh, refining, boiling down, concentrating the sugars. And we're gonna try and put this together. And the way that we're gonna gamify the process of stringing a bunch of tubes to the trees in terms of turning this into a game is gonna be basically like snakes. So we can't cross any of those lines. In reality, we can, but for the game, we wanna present ourselves a challenge, okay? So the role of one of the people, one of the players, the participants is going to be as the sugar shack. So this person is gonna have to hold the end, one end of all these different lengths of tubing. This is a game we'd actually play like in Thompson Woods, for example, going to different trees. Not necessarily sugar maples, but you know, any tree's good in a pinch, okay? And we'll see if we can get tubes to all of these trees without crossing any tubes. So we'll do this in a couple of timed rounds where each round is, let's say, a total of 30 seconds for everybody to find one of the hoses, make sure nobody else is latched onto the same hose, all radiating out from the person holding the far ends in the role of the sugar shack. And the rest of us are gonna be tappers that have to sort out those lines and then get them to different trees. And then in the second round with progression, we're either going to see if we can do it in 25 seconds or add additional lines beyond the number of participants so that some folks you know, run to the nearest tree immediately, lay out the line, it's good to go. They have to go back and get a second one as a bit of a relay race type format, okay? Cool. So that's the premise of the game. And the emotional basis that we're going for here is Fiero. Ah, we did it. The balance of team play versus competition. This is strictly a team-based game. We're all on the same team trying to get these things all set up in a short amount of time to simulate doing this in an economical fashion in real life. Um, so we have constraints on our time and the resources we have to set out all these lines. And we don't want to leave anybody behind in a game like this because some folks are gonna be faster or slower and so forth. So we're all gonna push on this task together. Pure team play, no competition involved. Or if you like, our competition is against the clock, not against one of the participants, right? We're not singling anybody out. We're not setting teams on some sort of uneven basis. Okay, cool. Any questions? about the Cressus or the game's brief. So this is not the three, 30 seconds or three sentences version of it. This is the more fully described sort of behind the scenes design version for us as a class. Any questions about the game design brief for our example? Cool. All right, so just Coming up with the three sentence rule set. We need one volunteer who's going to anchor one end of all of these lines and everyone else is going to, at the start of each round, grab a line and take it to a tree. Sentence one, 
that's kind of a long sentence, but so far so good. We'll have 30 seconds to do this and to make sure that none of the lines are crossing or touching each other. That was sentence two. Sentence three, we gotta make sure not to bang into each other and also keep an eye out for any low-lying branches that might pop an eye like an overripe grape. Sentence three and dealing with safety. Okay. And then from there, I start the timer and I'm the facilitator, so I'm not necessarily a player. You can set up games in which you, the interpreter, are one of the players, but you have a decided strategic and tactical advantage because you can literally change the rules as you go if you need to, if that serves the purposes of your interpretation. But in this particular game, I'm not a part of the game. I'm outside of it and facilitating, okay? So I'll be the timekeeper. If I have somebody who has expressed a need to not be running around in the woods for a game like this, the timekeeper is an additional representative role that we can assign to uh, hopefully that willing participant to give them an option to not have to run around like a crazy person trying to get things all set up and good to go. Okay. Cool. So any feedback so far? Anything that seems okay? Everybody sort of gets it? Thumbs up, thumbs down? Awesome. Thank you, Ben. And thank you, Logan and Nick. Cool. Good deal. All right. Next move is let's play a round one. And again, your role here is to find any way that this game could possibly go wrong. Things we're looking out for, are what could harm any of our participants? We wanna be very careful about that. What could paint any of our participants in a negative light to the other players? People get pretty into games. And so when somebody, um, if our rule set or our mechanics set them up to, um, in any way, I don't wanna give it away. I want you guys to see examples of this in our example. Uh, if there's any way to put somebody in an awkward spot relative to their teammates, that's a very stressful and embarrassing situation because you as an authority figure or power wielding figure in this group dynamic, um, we don't wanna put anybody in those particular shoes, metaphorically speaking, okay? So let's imagine that I've just said, go on round one. In your mind's eye, imagine round one of this very simple, very easy game unfolding. Let's identify as many ways as we can where something could go wrong. Go. Yeah, Connor's exactly right. We're in the woods and being outdoors has a basic fundamental underlying level of risk. We are gonna be around a bunch of down sticks. So maybe part of our phase zero or step zero in our five part outline, that safety check is to literally go around and pick up sticks and move them out of the, out of the play space that we are planning on using later on that hike later that day. Um, and of course, always, always, always rechecking as you arrive to that spot as that stop on the guided hike to make sure that no new branches have fallen in. All right, exactly right. Connor, A plus. What are some other things that could possibly go wrong in Thompson Woods? Anything, literally anything. Two people could go for the same game piece and like end up running into each other or um, trying to fight over it. Yeah. So we know that's very likely to happen with this layout of the game. Can you think of, yeah, uh, Ellie uh, running into other students on the sidewalks, like people maybe not even affiliated with our hike if we're doing this again in Thompson Woods as our example. Um, you know, somebody just trying to get to class doesn't have any cueing on what's happening or why people are running around in the woods and they don't have maybe all the information they need to get through that space safely if our gameplay is spilling out 
even close to the sidewalk, not even necessarily explicitly on it. But you know, if somebody's running at full speed, they can't just stop right at the edge of the sidewalk. They might go onto the sidewalk and loop back around and continue at full speed back into the game space to go for another silicone tube for the next tree. Ellie is exactly right as well. Good. Okay. So we have people potentially crashing into each other at high speed in a couple of different ways for a couple of different reasons. So I need to go back and modify my mechanics to account for that. And it could be as simple as everybody at all times, because this is a maple syruping work site for job site safety, everybody you have to have at all times at least one foot on the ground. The definition of a running gate is that at some points you have zero feet on the ground because you are pushing off and running. So we'll have some speed walking, which is fun and funny and is a heck of a lot safer than running into each other at full speed. Okay, so uh, constraining, not forcing, but constraining people to have a different gait helps them be more mindful in the space and physically slows everybody down so that our brains and our safety senses can kind of keep up with our bodies moving through the space. Nick writes, Widowmaker Falls, allergic reaction to environmental stimuli. Okay, so Thompson Woods has poison ivy. And although the Ruchiel dermatitis reaction isn't necessarily uh, an acute allergic one, we do have other allergens, especially at certain times of year. After there's any moisture on the ground above freezing, we're gonna have leaf mold. Um, you know, in certain parts of spring and early summer, we're gonna have a bunch of different pollens in the air and that can make things uh, uncomfortable or more difficult for people, for sure. Participant gets confused about boundaries and ends up further away due to another group in or near the woods. Yeah, okay. so. Um, kind of the, the milder version of Ellie's uh, people running into or getting mixed up with folks completely unaffiliated with the hike. So I need to, in my sort of preparation for the game, maybe use an extra long length of tubing to mark out a clear boundary, circle or ellipse or uh, oblate uh, volume of some kind. Okay, uh, let's see, I'm thinking bees and wasps too. Okay, so ground hornets. Uh, we don't have any murder hornets in Illinois yet, but uh, that could be a thing. So in our safety kit and in our safety prep before this, like long before we ever get to the point of doing this game outside, um, part of our safety check at the very beginning, getting to know our participants uh, is gonna have to be asking folks about allergies. Does anybody have an anaphylaxis risk? Does anybody carry an EpiPen as a matter of just day-to-day -day life? If that's you, that's cool. We just need to know that so we can help keep you safe is one way to start broaching that conversation, okay? Um, let's see, what else? These are great. These are all exactly in line with what I'm thinking as well. What are some other ways that this could possibly go wrong? We're using stretchy long lengths of silicone tubing, just like they do in a real uh, maple syruping operation. Easy to clean and keep sanitary, um, but rubbery and a little bit heavy, uh, bunched all together. What else could possibly go wrong in this game that I as the interpreter wanna catch before I ever deploy this game? Is that it? Tubing rips or gets, gets tangled. Um, have you ever seen using uh, anyone using a slingshot with that literally exact same silicone rubber tubing and it snaps and you know hits them in the face? Um, so maybe part of our design needs to be that, you know, string it out, but do not put it under tension and explain to folks, help the ones who are still kind of connecting the dots to understand if this is under tension and either person lets go of it, 
then the other person's going to have a robot day or could have a robot day. And of course, we like each other and we don't want to do something like that. OK, exactly. Exactly, Logan. Um, so, yeah, that's a thing. What we can do with that is show people the tubing and say, this is what it's like in real life. This is actually tubing that we used last year to make maple syrup. If you sniff the end of the tube, you might catch just a very faint sugary whiff. Um, if we also have something like static climbing line as a function of you know other games and stuff like that, lots and lots of games use different sorts of ropes uh, or lines or sheets, depending on the context. Um, those have less elastic stretch and less of a concern for snapping somebody in the face. Um, another major one for this kind of game, especially if people are running instead of kind of speed walking, is the tripping hazard, right? So all of these lengths of line are going to be kind of flat on the ground until they're stretched out completely, at which point each one becomes a tripwire or a garrote. So we want to think very carefully about, OK, how big of a play space are we going to do this in? And part of my homework before I ever run this even once is to select an area that's small enough but has enough stems and trunks within that small enough space that there's at least as many tree trunks as there are uh, lengths of tubing or rope, depending on which we're using. So um, for those of you in the guard, we're looking for a very target rich environment. Okay, maybe we're not at the step, but having two participants model how to pull it between two trees safely. Yeah, okay, absolutely. And we can do ourselves a big favor with this. Um, that sounds a little bit like a very quick and easy skill demonstration, maybe as a previous step entirely to um, this particular thematic point. So maybe thematic point one is, hey, let's grab uh, a bunch of lengths of this hosing and we're gonna get a sense of um, the muscularity, the proprioception, the, the heft, the, the texture, um, the rubberiness of these silicone tubes as we head to our first site. And so part of the skills demonstration is just getting the heft of it. How do you carry huge amounts of this stuff um, in uneven forest floor environments? And then we get to a spot and we practice the how to pull it between two trees safely without snapping the other person in the face or tripping somebody who's just walking by, uh, unaware that this line is about to be under tension and elevated. Um, and then having done that and everybody hopefully kind of gets it and we can practice and ha, 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 have a good time with it in a very safe way at low speed and not gamified. So there's all this perceived pressure to do it quickly and effectively. Only then do we build on that and switch from skill demo and practice to the game, which incorporates that skill demo in a much more safe way. Okay. So you are absolutely, absolutely for this uh, game design exercise, allowed to offload sort of key parts of it into previous sections on the hike. So wherever this game needs to be, if it's the last, if it's like thematic point number seven out of seven, and you've used all six of the previous ones to introduce different parts of what you're gonna use in this game, well then those three sentences you get, the 30 seconds you get to explain the rules and mechanics of the game, you've just shortcutted tons of stuff through six previous thematic points, very sneakily tied it all together in a way that helps people understand how these things relate and how they sequence and what it feels like to perform them in a safe and mindful, but also fun and challenging way, okay? So Nick's idea here is a good one and it's a good reminder for all of us to think holistically about this game design, it's again, never a game for its own sake, it's to help interpret something. And it's interpreting something in the context of additional thematic points before and potentially even after. You can use an application or an insight from the game to help illuminate or explain or interpret the next thematic point, okay? Cool. 
All right. Scaffolding tends to make things run much smoother across the board. All right. So um, in outdoor rec, in uh, interpretation, in education theory in general, scaffolding is a term uh, or jargon uh, phrase used to kind of identify how can I structure this activity in a careful framework like a construction scaffold such that um, the actual sort of intellectual lift of the ultimate activity is able to take advantage of everything that's up to that point and carefully and thoughtfully arranged around the participants by you, the facilitator, both prior to even that day. Uh, for example, when you're working with uh, interpreting Shawnee National Forest to local school children who are gonna be there on a field trip, you can interface and liaise with their teachers and have them you know, go through some modules that help the teacher teach something and help check something off their list for the year, but also helps prep those kiddos for um, being more effective on site. So that's uh, another way to scaffold, okay? So if you haven't seen that term before, uh, that's what we're talking about with scaffolding. So arranging everything to help make the next parts easier and more obvious and intelligible and a more meaningful challenge instead of just having people go through a bunch of steps because that's what you told them to do. Okay, scaffolding, cool. Other things, um, this is a great list we've got so far. We've got six or seven different substantive, substantive improvements and the game is gonna be a heck of a lot more fun and safer for it. Other ideas, I love these. Good for now? Okay, cool. So there's our example. Um, and as you can see, it was not particularly stressful. So you got this. All right, let's, uh, let's go for one or a couple of volunteers kind of in order. And as we get this, as we kind of get the hang of this after the first two or three, we'll actually break out into a couple of uh, room so that we can do two at a time in parallel um, and give everybody a chance to talk. I know in a bigger group like this, it's like waiting to see if anybody else is gonna talk and then maybe chiming in at some point, maybe not. So in a smaller group, more folks have a chance to, in multiple smaller groups, more folks will have a chance to chime in and we'll be able to get to everybody's game design, hopefully a little bit faster that way, all right? First, to kind of try this on for size with everybody and have all the brains uh, here in the same place online ready to help you out. Do we have a volunteer to go first and toss out a game brief? It could be one that we've tackled last week already or a fresh one that you had a chance to uh, ideate on over the weekend with our two game design exercises. Any volunteers? So my topic is birds and the game I chose was red light, green light, but everybody's going to be an owl and it'll be daytime, nighttime. Okay. And so in daytime, the owls are frozen in place and then at yep. night they are, okay, cool. So for, does everybody remember the basic sort of premise or mechanic of red light, green light? Most of us probably do, but anybody not familiar with that one? Ben's good to go. All right. It's pretty quick on the thumbs up trigger. I like it. All right. So Kendra, um, take us through any, you know, setup you would have or scaffolding you would have uh, before day of, if you're doing this with a school group, uh, if that's a useful idea any scaffolding or setup you might have um, in your introduction or any 
previous thematic points and then take us into the game and we'll see how we can help you out. Um, so I was thinking I'll probably do it in like an open grassy area so we don't have to mess with the trees and the sticks and tripping and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I don't really have any thematic points. I mean, besides like owls are important for like the rodent population and stuff like that. Okay. Um, yeah, that's pretty much all I have so far. Okay. So how would you how would you sort of prime people to play in three seconds, excuse me, three sentences and or 30 seconds? Um, so everyone is an owl. When I say nighttime, run to the finish line. When I say daytime, stop. If you're still moving, when I say daytime, go back to start and whoever gets to the finish line first wins. Okay. And that sounds like a pretty flexible layout. You could have, especially after maybe a quick first round, you could have uh, any willing volunteer if they wanted to be the, the caller, so to speak, or keeper of the day-night cycle. Maybe you call them Apollo or Helios. Uh, you could do that. What are, so let's go through any potential safety risks, you know, or not necessarily safety risks, but things that might block your effectiveness in using this game for interp anything that might stand in the way of the fun or interpreting the meaning of it with your players class what do you think Keeping people honest when they should go back. Okay, so how can how can Kendra do that? We can keep this as a task or responsibility that Kendra or whoever's the caller at the at the time. Um, we can offload some kinds of game tasks to the players to kind of self police, so to speak. Um, how could we do that? Next comment is keeping people honest when they should go back. So when Kendra calls daytime and anybody who's still moving at that moment maybe tries to just kind of sneak by. What's a good way for Kendra to police that potential or the, the incentive to cheat, right? Some people just want to win no matter what the game is. How could we help keep the playing field level for all of the players, including the ones who want to be a little more honest than that in their gameplay. could straight up call them out. Some people might feel pretty called out by that. So that can be a drag on energy if uh, the person feels like they were genuinely trying to play and Kendra interprets it as uh, this person was still moving and they're like, no, I wasn't. I was slowing to a stop, you know, California roll. All right, other things. Um, what other improvements could Kendra make? Oh, uh, maybe someone who doesn't want to play can be a predator who eats the moving owls during daytime. Some kind of hawk, etc. I like it. Another way that we can modify the game on the fly. So this is um, less a so Nick's idea, um, adding hawks or other predators uh, to the game space 
that's another mechanic. It might take another sentence to identify how that works. Um, adding sort of that extra layer of complexity and interaction or dynamic into the game. That's cool. So Kendra has the option to do that for any particular round. Um, another thing that Kendra might do is for people who have been called out so that they're not just standing on the sidelines for the rest of the game, which can feel like a long time if you're the first one out. Um, you can give folks a modified or second role, secondary role after they get called out. So for example, each person who's still moving when Kendra hollers out, daytime. Um, if the hawk gets them uh, or if Kendra you know, identifies somebody is out, then that person can become uh, prey or fodder for the owls. And instead of just trying to get across the finish line, the owls now have to try to get sort of through each prey before they cross the finish line. And you can do that as you have to capture any of them or you know tag any of them gently on the shoulder instead of whacking them upside the head as you walk by. Um, you can make it just like a, an increasing score. See how many people you can tag on the way forward. Um, because a lot of folks who are the most aggressive are going to be the ones who have the biggest trouble stopping. So they're more likely to be out in front. And if you turn them into uh, owl food right there where they get caught, then the owls now have a non-trivial strategic or tactical choice to make. Do I continue past this food and try and make it to the finish line? Do I optionally go for this or has Kendra required me to go through this um, to make the field a little bit more complex than just a bunch of straight lanes getting from A to B. Okay, so Kendra, both of our ideas, um, turning folks into hawks and turning some folks into you know field mice and other uh, common owl prey species, um, those are totally optional and each one changes the the look and feel of the game, the game's dynamics just a little bit, but for a pretty small cost and extra time explaining those things. Okay, cool. So Kendra, what's the, what's sort of the, the core emotion or the meaningful experience uh, from our PowerPoint that you want your game to be built around? What do you want this game to evoke in people? What sensation or feeling? Uh, I guess I just want people to have fun and be happy. Okay, happiness, cool. So for a happiness kind of mechanic, we generally want to structure the game such that A, everybody feels like they have a fair chance of making it across the finish line. Um, for folks who don't and they become a prey species, are they happy? Are they enjoying that? Okay, um, so some games, the game is designed where everybody can win kind of at their own speed. Um, those are very, very safe games uh, for people to play, even in mixed crowds where, you know, they're wanting to impress each other and so forth. Okay, so um, in early childhood development with your youngest participants, we're going to have people that, uh, kiddos, you know, fully realized people that are just very young. Um, and they tend to evaluate their choices and choose behaviors based on anticipating a reward, like winning a game or winning at least a round of a game or something like that, or seeking to avoid punishment, right? So it's the old carrot and the stick for uh, very young. And in the context of a game, losing can feel like a punishment for some. So um, if Kendra can come up with like a very slightly modified version of this game where, you know, if I have a bunch of small kids playing, it's easily possible for all of them to make it across the finish line one way or another. Let's say the owls can unfreeze each other like in freeze tag um, and help each other get across that finish line. Um, most participants are gonna be sort of moderately ethically developed um, according to the old theory. And this means they are making their behavioral choices 
not so much from a seeking reward or fearing punishment kind of perspective, but more a uh, how are my family and friends and acquaintances going to look on my behavior? Are they going to think this is good or cool or entertaining or funny or what have you? So if you think of um, junior high school age students, so age, you know, or sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth grade kind of region. Um, people are, from there on up through most folks into adulthood are making their public behavior choices based on the feedback they anticipate getting from the people that are with them, their in-group, okay? And then that leaves a small, a depressingly small fraction of society that's making public behavioral choices based on some kind of a higher ideal or an ethic or a principle or a moral. So these would be people who are um, participating in the game because they think it will help some of the younger people learn more about owl habitat management and conservation and so on and so forth. Um, because they are excited about Leave No Trace and they saw the LNT emblem and the trainer and the master educator patches on your interpreter day pack where you've got all your supplies uh, for laying out the space of this game. Um, those are relatively few and far between and you generally can pick up when somebody is in that case, they, they tend to be a little bit more Zen, I don't know, um, just a personal observation on that, okay? But most people are gonna be participating um, in a hike or games or anything. Um, they're mostly in that center of mass area looking for how their classmates or how their family group or their significant other, if they've got a boyfriend or girlfriend or a husband, wife, spouse, whatever, partner in the group, um, they're, they're participating or they're hot dogging and fooling around or they're talking over you because they're making evaluations on how their friends and family are gonna see them in that space, okay? So for any of these games, including Kendra's, um, it makes sense to have kind of an optional mechanics variant where it's pretty easy for most people to win for the kind of that lowest level of public behavior reasoning. And then portions of the game that, uh, a version of the game, excuse me, that helps most of your participants look good to their peer group. Okay, cool. So that's not something that Kendra has to come up with on the fly right now. I'm not going to you know, put her on the hot seat for that. But um, as we're going through these game design exercises, think about for your game, what's a version of this game? What's a sort of a, a flavored variant of this game that has pretty soft mechanics that you know, even a pretty young audience um, that might feel kind of self-conscious otherwise in a more strict or competitive format um, how can, how can I lift them up with this game? How can I empower them to connect with what we're interpreting? Okay. As well as sort of the, the regular version of the game and so forth. All right, Kendra. Awesome. What are some other ideas for Kendra? Anything else that we could do to help her catch any safety concerns? Is there any risk of injury with playing this particular game? in the particular setting that she's identified, a big open grassy area. Yeah, underground branches and holes for sure. Okay, so if it's a wide open grassy area, like if it's the lawn outside of the ag building where we have a bunch of big trees, um, we could get some decayed root holes in spots like that. There are a couple of um, storm drain grates as well in, in low spots and uh, you know, we tend to think of the lawn around the ag building as really pretty flat. There's like a big slope, you know, running down from Thompson Point. But in a couple of spots, there are big, deep and kind of steeply walled depressions around some of those storm drains to just aid uh, water drainage off of that grass before it gets too soft. Um, and we don't want to get caught by surprise. In the real world, Kendra would have had plenty of time to scope out the space, make sure everything's safe and good to go, as well as a part of her safety check at uh, 
sort of the pregame show phase of today's interpretive uh, experiences. Checking the weather report and in particular the dew point. So wet grass is pretty slick. And so if anybody's trying to run forward and then panic stop on wet grass, they could lose static friction and go dynamic friction, put their hands down on a panic stop and break a wrist. That's unlikely to happen, but it could happen. So Kendra can modify the game the same way that we did with the maple serping one to say, nobody runs. Everybody can speed walk and giant step as big as you want to, but no running. And then you would explain why, so that people don't feel like they're being unnecessarily restricted. But once you explain something is for just safety and everybody's enjoyment, then by and large, everybody's cool with it. You might still get a couple of folks hot dogging, kind of bending the rules a little bit, but you can work with that and interpret that and adjust the game on the fly if that happens. Awesome. Any other last insights for Kendra? Kendra, thank you very much, by the way. OK, let's do one more volunteer all together. And then uh, we'll split out into a couple of rooms. We'll try that out for the first time. And uh, we'll kind of turn through all of the rest to make sure everybody gets uh, some good feedback on your design so you don't feel like you are having to do this solo. All right, next volunteer. Thank you again, Kendra. Also, if things warm up, I'm all about playing some stop and go, uh, red light, green light on Wednesday. Let's do this. Next volunteer, and then we'll take our I guess I can do half time mine. break. All right, Connor, rock and roll. I'm not necessarily sure because it's just like I've been kind of like writing it down kind of like uh, over the past day or two, but I was kind of thinking like this is, that's a mix between kind of like importance of like species and like timber harvesting. And okay. kind of like, um, like tree identification too, kind of like combining them into one. Cool. All right. Yeah. So, so what's the, like, okay, go on. So kind of like what I have kind of laid out so far, like kind of each like species kind of like say, for example, like pine, it's like a higher point value because it's mostly kind of used for like specifically like for timber. And then you have like the hardwood species, which aren't as like high as a point value, but kind of stuff like that. And that's kind of where I've, where I've kind of like, that's, I'm kind of stuck on that part, kind of going out from that. Okay, so let's wrestle with that. Um, so folks are gonna have to have at least very basic uh, tree identification skills. And most folks are gonna be able to get, you know, uh, broadleaf versus needle leaf. Um, so at that very coarse division, you've got a little bit of skill, hopefully baked in with most participants. Um, the very youngest again, um, they're not going to do so well with knowledge-based games, but you can build the teaching right into the game for sure. Um, all right. So your question is about what about the, like how much to value the different hardwoods, for example? No, kind of like, kind of to build it off of that, like how, like how would I um, kind of like build the game out of kind of that basic concept? Okay. So um, if you think back to our list of game mechanics, uh, excuse me, the, the sort of the fundamental workflows of games, one of the basic game premises is gathering things, whether that is objects like tokens or um, gathering forces in like a real-time strategy game, like a Civ game or StarCraft, something like that, or, um, you know, uh, Dota 2 or something like that. Um, or something just abstract like points, so points for different kinds of trees. Um, and that by itself is a solid, solid game mechanic because for each tree you find, you get some number of points and your score never goes down. It feels good to watch our totals going up. Like everybody gets that at like a genetic level, okay? So um, 
I don't think you're way off in the weeds on this one. It can be as simple as, you know, let's kind of, let's kind of go on this simultaneously, everybody for themselves or work as a family group or work as a, a set of groups within each school class on this field trip or whatever. Um, see how many different trees you can find that have a score and you get to keep all the points for every single one of those trees that you find and you have one minute, two minutes, three minutes, something like that. Um, and you could build it out as successive rounds or you could do it as the progression of the game is just one round. Like there's no sense in repeating the search in the same area. Um, so the, the progression of that game is increasing difficulty like whatever tree is right in front of you everybody's going to do first and the next tree is 30 feet away and the next tree past that is another 45 feet away and so you got to move through the space and consume some of that time to take a look at these different trees maybe get a little bit closer to get a finer identification versus maybe you give you know one point for calling it you know needle leaf versus broadleaf Maybe you get five points for, you know, oak versus maple versus cedar versus cypress. Um, and then you get, you know, 15 points per tree where you get it down to the genus and species um, and stump, you know, something like that. Um, so you can build in kind of a, a skill ramp that's not going to put everybody on an even playing field because some folks are just going to know what differentiates oaks from maples and other folks are going to be trying to remember that because you just explained it at a previous stop and okay so oaks and maples both have lobed leaves but <coughs> what's what's the one which one looks more like a marijuana leaf which one looks more like a glove okay um so you can you kind of see how that could be a difficulty with the tree ID portion of it. Um, but you can, again, build in different levels of scoring um, for very gross differentiation, broad versus needle leaf, and very fine differentiation, genus and species. Um, and, you know, score things appropriately. And you can make it a little bit safer for folks who aren't feeling super solid on their tree ID and they don't want to get caught out in front of their friends by not knowing, and this is a, you know, a white oak versus a swamp black or something like that. Um, by doing it team style and competing the teams, not against each other, but against historic teams in the past, you can say something like, okay, so, most teams that play this this timber resource game get like 15 to 30 points now you guys are pretty smart so i bet you could i bet i bet you could beat that what do you think and you put it out there as a challenge and the consequence is not embarrassment in front of their friends if they don't hit that completely arbitrary point number. It's just a, it's like just a number, right? You can score it however you want. Um, because the people that they are losing to aren't present. Okay. So this is, this is along the same lines as making humor safe by targeting it at yourself. You're not making people the butt of a joke. You're not making people set up for losing if they don't have a technical training in tree ID. Okay. What do you think about that? Does that kind of help? Spur some thoughts? Yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. Okay, let me turn that out to the whole class because I'm only one brain and we've got like the better part of a dozen other smart folks here as well. So what do you guys, guys think? How could Connor integrate forest, like timber-based forest products and tree ID uh, into any kind of a game format? It doesn't have to be a, a scavenger hunt format like I'm suggesting potentially it could be anything whatsoever
I feel like you could do a type of game where, um, like, I'm imagining this is with kids and you're telling, um, as like, telling people to go touch a certain type of tree or a certain species of tree, a certain species of tree, and then, um, like, whoever chooses the right one is like gets a point for that round for going to the right um, or identifying it correctly. Cool. So you can you let them self-select instead of putting them all on the spot all at once with some urgency. I like that. Okay. Yeah. And you, or you could be like, everybody go touch a pine tree and then like whoever's the closest to whatever species you said. Um, yeah. Something like that. All right. Ellie says in chat, back when I was in tree ID to study, my friends and I would do Pictionary. Completely different than a scavenger hunt, right? But also a very functional game. Um, and uh, I think a lot of us have played Pictionary, but for those of us who haven't, um, Ellie, is Pictionary the one where you're given a thing and you got to draw it or uh, and everybody else has to guess it? Is that the right one? Yeah. Okay. Um, cool. So that, that takes a little bit of the, the potential sting or fear element of, you know, the pressure of tree ID in the field on the spot in the moment, um, out to like, I can't even tell this picture that's so-and-so drew is a leaf, <laughs> much less, you know, a white oak leaf. Like, eh, I can't, it doesn't look like anything to me. It looks like a hairball. I don't know. Um, and that's funny and it's lightweight and, super easy and fast and flowy, but it does give folks who um, who have a good grip on what you are putting out there, um, it gives them a chance to sketch something, um, but also make those tactical trade-offs in a game format of, do I wanna draw a perfectly detailed white oak leaf or just sort of a quick scribble that gets us 80% of the way there in 10% of the time, right? So we're making meaningful tactical trade-offs to get across the finish line in Pictionary. Okay, cool. All right, Ellie, that was a great idea. Um, other game formats that might work. While you're thinking about that, as a side note, um, Pictionary is about as like cheap and deployable anywhere as a game mechanic as anything. Um, and you can also talk about timber-based forest products uh, embodied in the pencil that people are drawing with and in the paper, right? So you get a little bit of free extra in Terp by putting out that particular approach. Whereas something like the scavenger hunt idea where if you wanted to embody the points in something physical like a, a wooden nickel per point so people can have satisfying handfuls of points accrued by the end of the game. Um, you got to go out and find a bunch of wooden nickels or make them or whatever. Okay, so Ellie's idea is a really, really good one. Not helpful in studying, but it was fun. Okay, so the game worked at least. Uh, other ideas for game formats for Connor? What else could he do? The board game photosynthesis, for those of you who are familiar with that, is a very, very sophisticated take on uh, forest ecosystem cycling and competition for sunlight versus shading out um, competitor species and, and organisms. Um, that's another way that you could accomplish this with a game like photosynthesis. So you're literally planting seeds and then the trees grow up and you're strategically trying to compete as the seasons progress and the angle of the sun moves and you're shading out trees based on that. Um, and you can, you can remove the tree ID in the field portion of it completely with a game like that because it's all, it's all sort of printed in representative tokens, different size trees and different age stages. Um, but photosynthesis is kind of expensive and the rules are not actually that complex, but you couldn't do it in three sentences. So again, another trade-off, another option um, 
maybe for a different kind of an audience or participants, not audience. All right, we are fully into our second hour. So uh, thank you guys and gals for these ideas so far. Let's come back in about five minutes. Um, by all means, stretch your legs, get your body moving again, cycle that lymphatic system with some actual movement, uh, get some water, rehydrate, maybe something that is glucose rich for the one third of calories that your brain is gonna expend uh, today. And we will come back at 2.11 on my clock, okay? See you in a couple minutes. I'll be around for questions too uh, in the meantime, if anybody's just gonna hang out, so. That's cool. See you in five. Yeah, so, God, they got the video back already. I'd seen a couple of like the fisheye lens kind of web camera quality initial shots, but uh, that's pretty sweet. That is a huge rover. That thing's what, the size of a minivan? I mean, it's nuclear powered. Uh, God, they used a sky hook, like a jet rocket powered hovercraft to like gently land it in uh, the thin Martian atmosphere above ground just ridiculous pretty cool stuff all right so we'll check out this video here in a sec Okay. It is kind of a KSP. Um, I saw they're coming out with a Kerbal 2, is that correct?
seeing that I did not release the announcement with our two documents for today's task. So I apologize for that. And let me go ahead and link those in announcements so you can see these documents that I've been referring to that we kind of went through last class, but um, are difficult to find on our horrible course website software. Uh, get those posted here right before we are set to head back into our game design charrettes. Okay. Finished and we're back to it. All right, um, let's see. At this point, let's go ahead and I'll put us in a couple of uh, kind of breakout rooms and uh, or if everybody hates breakout rooms, then we can um, all stay in here. Maybe this is a little bit less chaotic if we do it through chat instead of through the main room. Um, any preference, y'all, with breakout rooms like sub rooms with half the class each uh, versus having everybody here talking about two different game designs at the same time? Main chat? Okay. Cool. Let's do main chat then. Uh, let's see. So, uh, next volunteer. Otherwise, I can just, you know, start calling on people, but it's more fun when people volunteer. Uh, let's get two volunteers. So, give us the just the basic rundown on your game. Um, and Try out like a couple, three sentences for the rules and mechanics, and then we will help capture any easy upgrades for it to make it safer, more effective, um, a little bit easier on you, the facilitator. Sometimes some of these games are hard mode for you. Uh, it's a lot to keep track of certain games. Two volunteers. Come on, guys and gals, we're all going to do this. So next two volunteers, please. I can go. All right. Thank you. Um, anybody else? Yeah, I think I have something. All right. I can cool. go. Thank, thanks to you both. All right, so Danielle and Ben, in the text chat, um, go ahead and give us just the, the quick postage stamp description of your game. Um, and again, we're keeping these short on purpose. We don't want to over-sophisticate this and get kind of too in love with this game um, and just spend huge amounts of effort and time on it while interpreting. So we're doing a bunch of this work beforehand to front load the polishing. So give us the short version, um, maybe a one paragraph intro and those three sentences for the rules and mechanics, and we'll go from there. I'll also in chat post a link to the game design for interpretation announcement. It's right up front and center on our course website. Uh, 
but that was supposed to be available to you guys all weekend and it was not, I apologize. There you go with that if you wanna take a look. All right, so while Ben and Danielle are tapping up their sort of game presses or the uh, short brief uh, description of them, we want to definitely think a lot about how we can get the maximum mileage, so to speak, out of the options you have for representative tokens or props or items that you manipulate in the game. Um, like if you've ever seen one of those gigantic, like human size outdoor chess boards, those are representative tokens. Um, and while at the same time having enough flexibility with being able to present different versions or flavors of your games, again, for different sets of participants, different kinds of participants, um, young versus middle-aged folks, for example, um, using more abstracted tokens and objects to manipulate. So for example, using uh, a bit of the silicone tubing to demarcate the boundaries of that maple syrup in game um, versus a more abstract but more functional for other kinds of games long length of rope to do the equivalent function for that game but also be functional potentially for other kinds of games where we gotta you know mark out an abstract space or shape uh, outdoors or something like that okay so for your game um, think about what's the What's the stuff I need, bottom line need, to be able to put this game on um, effectively? And can I carry that in a small backpack or like a hip pack? Um, anything more than that, and you're carrying like a big duffel bag on a hike, and it's just, it's too much. You can split out those objects among some of your willing participants sometimes to help carry, but we generally don't wanna ask our participants to do our work as the interpreter for us, um, but we can, um, where appropriate and limited in scope, um, ask for interested volunteers to help out in that way. Um, so for whatever your game idea is looking like, do you want specifically representative tokens for that? Some games work best that way. Other games work just fine with very abstract tokens or roles. So for Kendra's earlier example, um, we need some kind of a starting line. We need some kind of a finish line at the very least. And maybe some other things like environmental hazards that the owls need to avoid, um, or maybe the predator hawks nest around which they can radiate and try and catch owls as they go. Um, do you need something that looks like a nest in order to make that understandable for your players? Or can you just point at a spot on the ground and say right here, even though there's nothing here, but just more grass, that's where our raptors, our birds of prey need to radiate out from to try and catch our poor owls as they're racing to the finish line. Um, so think about that for your game. This is a non-trivial question because uh, even with these prototypes we're gonna be doing this semester, um, these are live fire, prototype versions of the game. Like if we need rope to demarcate space, then have some rope available. Um, I probably have some things, uh, if it's like summer camp style gear or field measurement equipment, I probably got some of that in my lab or my office and I'm happy to let you borrow that for things. But um, sometimes I just don't have the stuff to make your cool idea come to life. So by all means, uh, in that case, look for an economical way to uh, bring the vision for your game to life. All right, so for Ben, Civilian Conservation Corps road game. Each participant gets a small section of a pipe. And everybody must come together to make a road for a marble to roll from a designated spot to a destination. I like this. I like this and I see where you're going with it. Um, way back in the day, like original NES 8-bit graphics, playing Marble Madness. It was one of the first games with recognizable like rolling physics and it just blew people's minds back then. So a game like this has tight feedback loops. As soon as that marble drops or 
um, and the bearing or whatever small quasi spherical stone if you want to make it harder. Uh, as soon as that flies off a sharp curve or drops into a gap between two sections that are not held close enough together, instant feedback for the players on what to do next to do to get the better game outcome in the next round or the next try. Okay. He writes, the marble represents resources and participants are building roads to multiple destinations, which was a core civilian conservation core thing to do. You gotta have roads connecting all the other stuff that they are improving for people. I like it. And it sounds like it doesn't require a bunch of high tech fancy things. You could, you could go as easy as cut up or like lengthwise split sections of a PVC pipe that's big enough diameter. Um, that would be super cheap and easy to do. You could go as sophisticated as hollow lengths of bamboo with the, uh, the chamber dividers gently sanded out. Um, and that maybe adds a bit of a skill element for people trying to coax the marble over slightly uneven interior curvatures of these sections of bamboo. Uh, for those of you who went to Mammoth Cave with me last semester, you saw how, um, well, they were earlier than CCC, but um, how turn of the century saltpeter miners at Mammoth Cave use full size, I believe they were poplar trunks, um, to ferry water into the cave by just a series of troughs dropping and a couple of pumps along the way. Pretty cool stuff. So yeah, this, this makes a lot of sense. It's got a lot of face validity. So the game closely reflects that which it is interpreting. Okay, so that term is face validity. Nice work, Ben. Danielle writes, it's based on invasive species and how they spread. Starts with one or two people as it, that is the invasive species. And the rest are spread out into different groups or bases. The person in charge or referee calls out that there's a disturbance at one of the bases and the players at that specific base need to find another one. The people who are it can then take over the base and or tag the players running to a different base to make them it as well. All right, so based on uh, what we used to call in Ohio chain tag, you may know it under a different name, but um, Danielle, I think the, the immediate dynamic there is gonna start shifting in the invasive species favor and left unchecked, they're gonna completely take over like kudzu. Cool, okay. Both of these are face valid approaches. Good ideas, guys. All right, so gang, let's help them out. Um, with Ben and with Danielle, what are some things that could go wrong? What are some interesting twists they could use on the fly to modify these pretty straightforward and easy to learn mechanics, so that's good, to help interpret the idea they're after behind the game a little bit more effectively or with a little bit more fun or a little bit more flexibly for different audiences or participants, excuse me, not audiences. You can jump into voice chat or throw it into text chat either way. like Roblox on the Civilian Conservation Corps marble game would be cool, like floods or other natural disasters. Okay, so you could set that up either way. Um, in a larger group where you have, let's say, 10 lengths of pipe, but 15 participants, maybe the other five could volunteer to be different kinds of uh, 
disruptions to the pipeline, like um, one section of pipe getting buried under a landslide or a cave-in or an avalanche, whatever is appropriate for the, the setting you're interpreting the CCC in. One of them could be allowed to be an earthquake, shaking the pipes while the marble's in there and you know just chaos ensuing. Um, okay, yeah, that's got some legs. You could have a half dozen different um, impediments or other natural disasters just kind of in your back pocket, metaphorically, and deploy them once things get pretty well figured out with that first round, like they get the marble from point A to B, point B, start to finish, and then you kick it up a notch, right? I like it. Upside on those pipes, again, they look exactly like what you're talking about as a CCC infrastructure, kind of a temporary thing, like how they got stuff from spot to spot with actual piping, but also talking about sort of the more, uh, slightly abstracted road network idea of forest roads that they had to cut. In some cases, hand chisel out or dynamite out in different places and so forth. Uh, downside of that is we got to carry a bunch of lengths of pipe around. So if they're wooden pipes, then, you know, they'd probably be pretty big, but light. So kind of bulky. Um, if they're metal pipes, heavy, but small, um, you know, we'll have to find some sweet spot for that. So um, that's not really a problem. It's an interesting design challenge. Lots of different ways you could solve it. Ellie writes, Danielle, if at some point you want to go back in favor of native species, you could have a round or change a rule where people have a chance to no longer be invasive. Like people who are it have 10 seconds or whatever to get to a certain base to be native again. Okay, interesting. That would be really funny if, um, let's say after three rounds, all but two of 10 players are it and it's you know eight out of 10 invasives and two out of 10 natives and then you have that 10 second like lightning round to get to a base and switch back to native um you know representing invasive species control or natives slowly out competing invasives in like a um a senescence or forest se succession model um and all eight of the invasives make it to a base and then everybody's native, right? That could happen. Um, that's one of those edge cases uh, or maybe you get uh, a group where they're all laughing and having a good time and enjoying the game and none of them want to be native. They like being the hunter instead of the prey, so to speak. And so nobody even tries to go native. Um, you could get any or all of those combinations, you know, depending on how many rounds you run. Um, and as the interpreter, you can kind of connect that, interpret that to how everybody going back to native or nobody going back to native or some folks going back to native and others not, um, how that maps onto real world native versus non-native invasive species dynamics, right? I mean, each of those map onto different scenarios we have even just on the Shawnee. Um, and right here on campus. So that works. I like it. That's a great idea, Ellie. Nick writes, on the tag game, you could also have volunteers doing invasive removal, and those people get soft mesh balls to throw at the chains to break them apart. And the volunteers have to escort those people to a disposal area. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, I think that could work. Um, so then you've got three roles, native, non-native, and volunteers. That makes a lot of sense. And three roles is not too many. More than about three or four different roles, like meaningfully different ways to be on the game board or in the space for the game. Um, that starts to get a little bit complex. Um, and remember, we got three sentences to lay down the initial rule set. So um, that might be the kind of thing where after a couple of rounds, Danielle introduces the idea of, um, you know, a weed sprayer or a non-native uh, specialist to help extirpate those locally. I like it. And it continues, maybe like multi-round business for people who think the first round is too easy. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that seems like a wise way to grip that option. Good call, Nick. 
Okay. Cool. These are great. Any other ideas for folks? Um, otherwise, we'll move on to the next pair. Uh, thank you, Danielle and Ben. These are cool. We're going to have lots of fun this semester playing some games. I can see it already. Uh, I get excited about this stuff. All right. Uh, okay. Next two. Oh, uh, yeah. Next two volunteers. Let's tackle the next pair of games. We'll do it here in chat. So who would like to go next? We got the Logans. Um, we got Lincoln and Ellie, I think. Uh, Nick, maybe if you want to go again. Who's up next? All right, Ellie's up and I'm just gonna team up with her. Who else is going? Thank you, Ellie. All right, cool. Same drill for you two. So give us like the one paragraph, um, short paragraph of the premise of your game and a couple, three sentences for the rules and mechanics. We'll be off to the races metaphorically. OK, so. Next, uh, next discussion point while um, Ellie and Logan are uh, rolling through their just, you know, brief descriptions to throw in the chat. Um, because interpretation is a little bit different every day with different groups every time and so forth. Um, we always want to be very comfortable um, with these games and again with the skill demos and every other sort of um, way to interpret a particular thematic point, all these different techniques that we'll go through, um, always be ready and able to skip it. So for example, if it's just kind of threatening rain and you know you've got about 40 minutes for what is typically an hour long thing, um, but it's definitely an outdoor game that you have associated with this particular interp hike or you know, fireside chat or, or whatever. Um, it's very important that you have as many options as possible across those thematic points, including maybe even multiple games, uh, two, three, four different games that are appropriate at different stages. Um, for interp that needs to happen sequentially or appropriate at any time for interp that can happen topically, meaning in any order, um, such that you can respond to things like weather to keep people very comfortable and safe and, and focused and engaged on what you're doing. Um, and in the, in the thick of things, as you are making sometimes the hard decision to skip a game that's fun, but just it's a little bit too dark out because it's late in the afternoon and it's winter time, uh, or the ground is just too wet to play safely on grass or whatever. Um, you are just automatically moving along to the next thematic point in your mental outline of your interp, such that to your participants, they never know what they're missing. Um, it's perfectly fine because they're just kind of along for an interesting and fun and engaging journey with you, their interpreter for that hour or 40 minutes or however long it is. And that works out well in your favor. If you are just struggling one day, like maybe coulda, woulda, shoulda stayed home sick, but you are bound and determined to, you know, connect with people over some stuff that you really enjoy interpreting, um, you can, skip by the high energy activity and go with a more staid and solid approach so that you have something left in the tank for the next group that day um, when you're kind of flagging a little bit and struggling on energy level. 
Okay, so um, the idea here is to have a bunch of good, functional, flexible, fun, like interesting games, but also to have enough of them and enough skill demos and other kinds of things that we can on the fly prune from a longer outline that we'd never have time for down to what fits that group really well that time. Okay, so that's a message that we've heard a couple of times in the past talking about these outlines uh, and the thematic points that they contain. But I'm just gonna give it another beat on the drum and give you permission to on the fly, kind of towards the end of the semester when we're hooking all these together into a single hike with a game or two, maybe a skill demo, other stuff as well. Um, whatever you feel like you want to use that day to be successful under that day's context, your participants in class, the weather conditions, your comfortability with different thematic points that you've developed, um, you are 100% empowered to pick and choose what would be most successful for you on that day under those conditions. Okay, cool. So we're going to make lots of different kinds of games, knowing that we won't ever get to use all of them at once, but we get to use all of them in different circumstances. All right, so Logan writes, I know I've beaten this to like a dead horse, but my topic is first line medic, specifically tourniquets. Pretty sick simile, like a dead horse. So sick that it's dead. <laughs> Sorry, moving on. Uh, Logan continues, but I would do a race between competitors on how to properly put on a tourniquet, where we can do a bracket style race between two competitors. Rules, it must be on properly. If not on properly, you must start again. Even if the other competitor finishes before you complete putting on your tourniquet. Okay, so this might be one of those that pairs really well with a skill demo right before of, here's how we put on a tourniquet. I will show you, if you would like to, you can try it. And then roll right into a game of, if you would like to try it, let's do this competition style and see who's the fastest at keeping people alive. Okay. Uh, Ellie writes, my game isn't competitive or anything, kind of more chill and laid back. Perfectly fine. There's no requirement for it to be intense and competitive. Topic is based on seed plantings, and it's a matching game where the participants are either given a picture or a description of a fruit, vegetable, maybe tree species, different oaks, for example, uh, using different acorns. And they have to match it to the correct name of the species. Cool. So we often see staffed and non-staffed versions of matching games like this and ID games like this um, inside a visitor center, inside the um, like the on-site facility in major campgrounds, for example, where interp sometimes happens under a roof. Um, so that's cool. And Ellie's investment in stuff, the materials needed to interpret this, a nice walk in the woods gathering some acorns right, or different seed packets and so forth. That could be a super fun time for her as well as everybody else. Okay, uh, Nick writes, I think you could do part one of gathering the necessary materials, pause to do a skills tutorial on tying tourniquets and giving them practice time. Then part two could be to have them do a practice race on fallen tree limbs. Yeah, cool. So kind of that sequencing approach, very good. I like the idea of doing a practice race on fallen tree limbs because there are consequences to um, incorrect tourniquets. We can have you know, superficial tissue damage and certainly in a game, supervised game format, we're not gonna be leaving them on nearly long enough to cause any uh, peripheral perfusion damage but, uh, or vascular damage. But uh, yeah, using a tree limb as a proxy for a human arm or leg, not a bad idea. Definitely don't wanna use it as a proxy for a neck. Um, there you go. Uh, tying too fast, racing on people is fairly iffy. Yeah, for safety concerns, for sure. Um, cool, so good ideas. Make it so, Logan. Ideas for Ellie and Logan. What else could go wrong? What else could they do to um, modify the game for a younger or high energy audience? Participants, sorry, I keep using that word. Um, what could they do to have a different version of it, you know, indoors versus outdoors? Could Ellie's game be as effective indoors as outdoors? Could you have parallel versions of the game for rainy and sunny days? 
what do you guys and gals think? What can we, what can we tighten up on these, sand off some uh, rough edges on these great ideas, figuratively speaking? Logan, if uh, let's say you had, you know, for example, um, a demonstration or practice dummy for, you know, they have them for CPR and mouth to mouth resuscitation and all sorts of different sort of live dummies made out of silicone or um, basically resin versions of ballistic gel that look and feel basically human ish. Um, and have the right amount of give for judging how tight a tourniquet should be, for example. If you had access to one of those, you know, you can put a funny shirt on a practice dummy and uh, give it a name and a hypothetical personality to kind of bring the, the, the bleeding wound victim a little bit more to life, so to speak, and add some humor into the situation because you know, some folks might get a little bit stressed out about thinking about medical emergencies and stuff like that. Um, we can take some of that stress out by saying, hey, you know, remember, this is just a practice dummy, or this is just a branch about as thick as an adult person's arm. Let's practice on that. No penalty for trying out some different things to see how it works for you. Um, we're not going to hurt this branch. It's fine. Okay. Let's see. Uh, I've gotten to use them. They're really neat. The dummies? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Some of them are super like crazy expensive. Also, there are, <laughs> there are dental practice robots that, you know, like open the mouth and stuff like that. And they'll react realistically, like they'll jerk away from the head of the tool if you jab them in the gums and stuff. I mean, just, that's ridiculous. Whatever. That doesn't have anything to do with uh, this, but awesome. Yeah. So you can have fun with it. It doesn't have to be super serious, grim, dark. Um, in the future, there are only tourniquets, uh, Warhammer 40k, um, gothic horror setting for your game. It could just be a pretty fun race on a dummy or a branch or whatever. Golly, move, scream, and have a pulse. That's, that's terrifying and awesome. I, for one, welcome our new robotic overlords. Okay, ideas for Ellie and Logan. How else could they do this. Um, are there any variations on a bracket tournament that Logan could use to uh, keep things fair for, let's say, an odd number of participants? If Logan's dealing with a group of nine people, that doesn't map easily or clearly onto a bracket. Somebody's going to have an advantage. So what's another way that Logan could format this into a game that isn't based on um, powers of two is what you need for a, a typical like NCAA basketball bracket type format. Nick writes, for the matching game, you could have them practice what you described, then have people carry along those cards and pictures to try to find those things on your hike. Cool. So that effectively lowers the difficulty by removing the memorization aspect of it and um, focuses more on like matching characteristics in the wild to the book or the card or the you know, laminated poster, or whatever folks are bringing along. Um, I think that in my experience uh, doing interpretation um, with species ID kinds of things, even having like the book or the dichotomous key for more advanced folks um, or like the big poster with nice, beautiful, technically correct illustrations of that kind of leaf and that kind of acorn or other nut uh, and so forth. That's still challenging. Um, some people struggle with the spatial reasoning to map this, this oak leaf is a white oak leaf and we have a picture of a white oak leaf on you know the, the pamphlet or map or whatever. Um, but it's a slightly different color of green. And I'm not sure if that's significant or not. Like the shape is about the same. It's got the same number of lobes and kind of the same configuration, um, but the size is different. Like it's, you know, it's maybe a, a tiny little illustration because you've got to fit 40 different species leaf or, you know, um, mast, you know, tree, uh, tree nut or berry uh, images or illustrations on there. Um, 
And it's even harder for some reason on printed materials with photos versus beautiful sort of carefully handwritten and well lit um, technical illustrations. Just um, some people just really struggle with that and that's okay. So um, Nick's idea to kind of remove the additional step on top of matching that to the guide of memorization, that's probably gonna help a lot of your uh, younger or less technically proficient players for sure. Cool. Ben says, with Ellie's matching game, there could be a variation with things like seeds, names, fruits, leaves, etc. Players could get extra points for matching multiple things to a species. Yeah, okay. I like that. So that scales well with performance. Um, somebody who just gets one characteristic, you know, gets the point for that. And somebody who's, you know, really into it and just bird dogging down the answer and matches four characteristics for the same specimen, um, you can give them a reward for that, even if it's just totally imaginary points. Um, let's see, Nick says, yeah, I agree. I've had much better luck with individuals only having one picture or pairing up with a second person to look for those two things, et cetera. Still doing the matching exercise pre-hike though, because that's great, cool. This is all good feedback. All right. I cannot wait. Uh, I cannot wait to see us trying to tie some tourniquets because like there's a real life and death time limit on how long it takes, you know, somebody to get that tourniquet on, especially if you're the person with the tourniquet and the wound. Um, you're dealing with the shock and trying to uh, stem the the flow of the red stuff that normally goes round and round and stays on the inside. Um, these are gonna be fun. Okay, cool. We've only got three minutes of class left. Dang it, dang it. We almost got to everybody, but not quite. So thank you guys and girls uh, for, sorry, men and women for uh, volunteering uh, as you were able. And I apologize again for not having the game design uh, exercise and brief linked it was all available on the course website but it's useless trying to find anything on there so um we won't have those due for today um let's try and get those in for wednesday but since class is online lately um you know i'm going to be pretty flexible on deadlines as always for this class this semester um if the weather ends up continuing to warm up and dry out uh i would love for us to meet in our normal space 187 at 1 p.m. on Wednesday. And let's let's come ready to go with some of these games, okay? So if you need some rope or you need to gather some acorns and leaves, uh, if you need to have a couple of maybe several tourniquets, uh, either formal or improvised, kind of ready to go for us, as simple as a bandana or as fancy as, you know, like a, a pro grade, um, combat grade tourniquet, awesome have that stuff ready to go. Uh, I'll try and uh, narrow down our weather forecast for Wednesday's class as soon as possible tomorrow so you guys know how to plan. Uh, worst case scenario, we're back online and we'll keep doing our thing. Um, but best case scenario, we'll actually get to do some stuff together. Well, we'll start having a pretty good time with all this stuff. Okay, so now's your chance. Start gathering things. Um, if you were not able to find the game design brief and exercise, Check our course website or use the link here in text chat and uh, we'll reconvene on Wednesday. I'll hang around here for a couple more minutes if anybody has any questions or if you would like additional suggestions or feedback from me on how things are going so far, I'm happy to do that. Okay, thank you all so, so much. And sorry we ran out of time for the last couple of folks. We'll try and get you on Wednesday, okay? See you then, either online or in person and I'm around for questions. What's up, Kerbal Space Program? How you doing, Lincoln? All right, maybe you're away from your computer. I'll see you on Wednesday, Lincoln. Catch you next time.